To press on with our program, uh, we're now going to have a presentation uh, by our own Professor Menu Ampim um, on Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the origins of African Heritage Month. Uh, Mr. Ampim is the president of our African American Staff Association and also the chair of our History, Anthropology, and Geography Department. He is a tireless warrior for uh, racial justice on our campus and in our district. Um, he is one of those people where, uh, as you see him work, you can you all you want to do is follow him because he inspires you to be your best self. Uh, and so none of us are able to do this work without leaders like Mr. Ampim. And so, on that note, I will turn it over to Mr. Manu Ampim as we talk about Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the origins of African Heritage Month. Mr. Ampin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. George Mills. I, uh, I, pre I appreciate that. And uh, good that, that so many of you have, uh, joins us, have uh, joined, us, um, joined us this evening. So good to see so many of you. So it's my, uh, it's my task to, uh, it's my task to share with you the, uh, the knowledge of uh, Carter G. Woodson, the man who is the reason for the season. It is uh, Carter G. Woodson who is the founder of African Heritage Month or what people uh, call Black History Month as well. So I'm gonna show some slides and give you some insight about Woodson's uh, vision and the impact of Carter G. Woodson as one of the, the most influential educators and historians in the 20th century who gets his due to an extent, but not fully. So I hope in the few minutes that I have is to put in context the, uh, the great work of Woodson so that you will know exactly what his impact has been. And so, uh, so we'll look at Carter G. Woodson and the origins of, uh, of African Heritage Month. And then in the few minutes I have, you'll know why we call it African Heritage Month. Uh, even though many might say Black History Month, there's no problem with that. Um, description as well, but we have to embrace Africa, which was clearly the direction of Carter G. Woodson. And so I'll present this to you kind of in a nutshell, but I think you'll get the point of, uh, of Woodson's work and his tireless uh, effort to make sure that, that Black people were not continuously written out of the pages and chapters of U.S. history and world, and world history and civilization. So uh, Here's Woodson. Woodson is the, um, he is the reason for the season. And this man, uh, you talk about working tirelessly. Well, Woodson was that, he was that person who actually worked uh, tirelessly in his effort. And this is the many dimensions of Carter G. Woodson. You always see him in his suit. He's always uh, serious. And, um, he, or, and he, he founded the organization now known as the Association, Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, which continues the work of Woodson three quarters of a century after he passed away. And this image of, uh, on the bottom left, I found this image of Woodson. He's with students at Morgan State University in 1931, which is my alma mater. And um, so Woodson, he really had a tremendous impact and I think you'll be able to see that. So uh, these are the years of Woodson. His uh, parents, they actually were born in slavery and it took him quite a while to, to finally obtain a formal education, but he eventually, he earned his doctorate degree from Harvard. And then at that point, he began to take off, uh, he earned that degree in 1912, but he became a scholar scholar in a very short period of time. These are some of the contributions of Woodson. We can't cover them all, but as I said, he's a historian and educator who wrote more than a dozen books. He's a founder of what was then called in 1915, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Negro is not used these days as African-American. Instead, he founded a journal right away uh, to be able to teach and disseminate the knowledge and the contributions of black people. He's the founder of what was then considered to be and called, because that term was more popular in the early 20th century, but 
Negro History Week, which is what I will put in perspective. And when he founded it in 1926, then um, this eventually, for Woodson, it wasn't just a week or a month, but he conceived of a whole year of study that should be expressed and taught within a couple weeks period where people will show what they were learning. But he never thought that a two week or even a month period would be enough. He often talked about a whole year, a so-called Negro history year. And his journal was an academic journal. So what he did to make it real and relevant for everybody, particularly schools, whether colleges, high school, uh, middle school, elementary school, he created the Negro History Bulletin, which was designed specifically for teachers and educators. And this year, 2021, is the 95th annual celebration of the, case, the occasion that was initiated by Woodson, who could, have never, who, who could have never accomplished his great work without an organization. One of the problems in the, this country is that it's usually an elitist history. In other words, people talk about individuals and they put individuals above collective organizations. So as you know, George Mills just mentioned that I might be the president, but there's no way that any one of us can do anything meaningful unless we have a collective effort. And those who are organizers on this call, you know that. So it is a, a, uh, a era to continue to teach what I call elitist history you know, the, the individual here or individual there, and there's no focus on the organization that either recruited them or the organization that they may have founded that helped to support their work and their vision. So Woodson was always a part of a collective. And even if you look at the founding of the organization, there's two other names on that on those founding documents. And he created a community of writers and scholars, uh, black scholars and white scholars who were challenging the dominant perspectives on uh, U.S. history and people attempting to uh, promote the propaganda that Black people had no role in U.S. or world history. So Woodson took this on and this became his mission, his life's mission. He was married to his work and, uh, and that comes across in his stern focus on growth, development, and having a practical impact not only in the Black community but in the nation. This year, his organization, as they continue to work, the 95th anniversary, this is the or, or annual theme, it's the Black family, representation, identity, and diversity. So this is their theme this year, and his organization sets the theme every year, which has been acknowledged by every U.S. president for a number of, um, of years now, but it's his organization that sets the national theme. Sometimes we have the same focus at our CCC events, or sometimes we might we might have a different focus, but either way, we recognize their ongoing work and our focus has always been to look at the experience in the US, but not be limited to slavery and go back beyond the Atlantic Ocean to embrace the African continent. And so Woodson in his work, he wasn't just an academic person talking to other academic people. For Woodson, how do you, you make the knowledge practical? Because uh, if somebody is studying and reading, but if there's no practical application, it is useless. So for Woodson, it wasn't just about, about keeping the knowledge among certain people. So he began to do public lectures. And the reason why he did lectures is because he was highly critical. And I'll read some of what he said. You'll be shocked and stunned at the critical indictment that Woodson issued against these, what he considered to be and called uh, pseudo historians. And, uh, and misinformed orators. So he began to do public lectures because he was tired of all of the street corner lecturers misinforming the masses of the people. And he also developed the teacher lesson plans. You can see that from the Negro History Bulletin. Also, it's all about images. It's about images. So they had posters of important people to make sure people could understand and recognize these people. Also, you teach the history through plays, through performances. He helped to develop black history clubs where people would read and study and begin to recognize the and conceptualize black people in a completely different way. They had black history kits where there'll be speeches and, and writings and, and plays. And these kits were made available to the schools. And they made these kits available for $2. So all of those, those black schools in rural areas that had very little resources because of a racist Jim Crow segregation to segregate black people out to exploit them and give them no money to heat the school buildings in the winter, no money for 
textbooks, school books, and, and little pay for teachers. So Woodson understood they didn't have much money. So they created these kits and sold them for $2. And they add a little bit more to the kit and they sold those kits for $2.50. And so a, a school could afford that. But he also created, along with his colleagues, the home study department. So if if, if those if those other areas did not impact people directly, then they can study from home, a correspondence course. And Woodson made a point to make sure that those home uh, correspondence courses, they, they, they met academic rigor. He wanted everybody to, to learn and one who learns teaches. And for Woodson, it is it was incumbent upon him and his organization, the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History to be able to reach everybody in the community to make sure that they have an opportunity to learn about themselves because self-knowledge is the basis of true knowledge. And if we look at Woodson's tireless work, then he's one of the giants that has to be given his due, not just to praise him, but to continue his work. And so Woodson is known for his, his tireless scholarship and his home was the office right there in Washington, DC. Now the National Park Service has, has taken it on, but you know, for years that house was in, uh, it, it was uh, dilapidated. How do you allow the house, the home, the hub of one of the great scholars of his time to just go into disrepair? You know, so now, cause he, the office of his association was downstairs, he lived upstairs. And um, so we know about his scholarship to some degree, I'll give you more insight today, but his impact was, uh, was national and beyond. So how many know that this man actually had a 20 cent stamp in his honor? You know, Woodson had a tremendous impact. And what I learned, folks, is that back around 2002, 2003, I went up and down California. That was one year in February that I did a lot of presentations. And we went up and down the state from college to college to college. And I, I learned something and, uh, and found out something extraordinary. With all of the African Heritage Month events, that there was not one single organization, whether it was a Black Student Union or African uh, Alliance Club or, or um, Associated Students, whoever organized the events, and there were many of them that I went to in one month and gave presentations, there was not one single person within any of these organizations and academic campuses up and down California that had any idea that Carter G. Woodson was the reason for the season. They were having events in total ignorance of Woodson's work and, and what he saw should be the focus of the February uh, events as a celebration. And so I decided that never again would I ever participate in any program, whether I'm sponsoring the program or being asked to pre uh, present without highlighting the work of Carter G. Woodson. And so uh, his, his scholarship is uh, well established. This journal, uh, this is the first issue of the journal. So as soon as he organized his organization, the scholarship began to pour out. Now it's called the Journal of African American History, and this is the leading journal for Black scholars in the country. This is the the, the current one. You have John Lewis and uh, C.T. Vivian, both uh, giants of uh, civil rights that passed last year. That's the latest issue of this highly influential journal that comes out uh, every quarter, and it's also the Negro History Bulletin. This came out nine months a year, uh, nine uh, uh, months a year, because it corresponded with and coincided with the school year. And this was a tremendous resource that teachers can count on and use, and uh, and 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 make sure that they were teaching correct information. He was a stickler on facts and details. Uh, Woodson had little patience with with ignorant presentations. He really did, and so he was a stern. A uh, scholar that wanted to always go to the primary or firsthand sources. So um, his work is really solid. Now, one of his books, remember I mentioned he, he, uh, he wrote over 12, is A Negro in Our History. This became the standard text. The standard textbook was this one for years and even decades that everybody used this. If they wanted to, to know accurate information about Black people in the U.S. and their contributions, they would read the Negro in our history. And Woodson embraced Africa. He didn't just think that the focus should be on the experience in the U.S. So the first chapter of this book was on the, uh, was on Africa. That first chapter, the first 14 pages, he talked about the African uh, culture, African tradition, 
And now keep something in mind, in the 1920s, this is pioneering work because very few people in the country had any real knowledge about African civilization. There was William Leo Hansberry in that same year. He was an independent scholar, uh, an independent thinker, just like Carter G. Woodson and at Howard University. Howard University in DC, one of those, they, they call it those people, those Howard folks, they say it's the Mecca of black institutions is the best, but Howard, they ridiculed, um, they, uh, um, they, uh, they, they, they ridiculed when um, um, they, they ridiculed the scholar who created in the history department there, the African civilizations section. And when, and so William Leo Hansberry created that African civilization section in the history department in 1922 and people condemned him across the campus. They thought that that uh, Hansberry was bringing down the tradition of Howard and bringing down the, the tradition of the campus scholarship because he was teaching a non-academic subject of African civilizations. And so Howard University never honored Hansberry. It, it was the students who honored uh, Hansberry. It was Joseph Harris. It was Dr. Chancellor Williams. And on the 50th anniversary, of the African civilization section being created at Howard University on the 50th anniversary, 1972, was the first time there was any real public acknowledgement of Hansberry. And it was and it was at Howard, but they didn't have a problem with it then in 72 because Hansberry had already passed several years earlier. So it was the students that honored him. And I'm simply mentioning Hansberry in 22 because that's what the general uh, tenor of the environment was. In fact, it was hard for Hansberry to even get a PhD because he knew more than his professors. So it's within this context, as well as the Jim Crow racial segregation context that people like uh, um, Hansberry or Woodson, they began to create their scholarship. So there's, so he's learning, but he's also producing and uh, challenging people to respect the tradition of black people in the U.S. and beyond. And so, and in his indictment and his criticism of the ongoing uh, people within the black community as well as the racist. He wrote The Miseducation of the Negro. It is a classic. If you haven't read it, I would highly suggest that you order it today. Order it tonight. And you would think, if you didn't know it was published in 1933, you would think it was written last year. It's a stunning indictment that the educational system in the US, while it empowers the white student, it makes the black student feel inferior because he's never discussed, she's never discussed in any field, any subject, art, science, you name it, they're always left out as if they have nothing to do with US or world history. And this is why he wrote a stunning indictment of, uh, of, of, uh, of it. Of course, you know, some of the intellectuals had a problem because he was indicting them. He said that the longer <laughs> they stay in school, that they will be a hopeless liability to their own community. <laughs> so, and uh, one thing, one book that most people are not familiar with is uh, what his organization calls the Woodson Appeal. This is an unpublished manuscript that he actually wrote in 1921. And the reason why Woodson never published the appeal it's because it was even more of a stunning indictment. This time it was focused more on the vicious racist Jim Crow system in America. And Woodson decided not to publish the work even though he had finished writing it because he knew that it would have a negative effect on receiving uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the philanthropic funds from, from those that were giving some money to his organization. He didn't want the money to dry up. And this manuscript written in 21, 1921 was not discovered until 2005. Woodson called it the case of the Negro. They changed the title. I would have left it the same. Just leave it the same. If you don't, you know, Negro, I know that's outdated. That could be explained, but he said it's their case of black people and why there should be support and why black people were not doing so well in America it was not the fault of their own. And, um, and so what happens here is that Woodson, as he's challenging uh, people, and he's, he's also looking at what he can do to begin to change things in America, he had to deal with George Hagel and Arnold Toynbee. These are two of the most important uh, scholars, not because they were accurate, they were important because of their influence. So anybody studying philosophy, you're going to learn about George Hager, uh, Hegel. Anybody who's majoring and studying in history, you're going to know about Arnold Toynbee. Arnold Toynbee said that out of the 20 
one major civilizations and five satellite civilizations. In other words, a total of 26 civilizations since the beginning of humanity, the only primary group, according to Arnold Tornby, that never made a contribution to any uh, civilization are black people. And so Woodson had to challenge this uh, made up, invented nonsense, people dominating fields, and they're making these things up in order to justify the white domination that was based on colonialism and slavery and had nothing to do with this some some genius. And so Woodson had to challenge all of this because this was the dominant uh, the dominant opinion and dominant scholarship in the field. So Woodson began to publish his work, and he said this that publishing the truth is self defense. He made that very clear. This is uh, academic warfare. It's about winning the idea battle. And for Woodson to win the idea battle, for Black people to win the battle, he said we must publish. And that's why you have a plethora of articles and books that came out. It was a tremendous uh, barrage of, of literature to challenge. And he said that anytime, you know, this a propaganda book comes out, then you have to have um, b Black people write 12 books to try to counter the one book that was written that created a bunch of nonsense because they had a wider distribution. And so he, he talks about that. Now, what are, his, what are his contributions? Well, he put black people in the center of their own experience rather than being talked about as if they have no, uh, no relevance themselves. So he, put, he centered black people in their own experience to have people to be able to embrace themselves, to recognize that, that uh, they have something worthwhile to offer to the society and to the world. So for him, it was to make black people the subject of their own experience rather than the object of somebody else's contempt. And so this is part of the, the, the vision and the work of Woodson as he began to publish facts, positive facts and, and contributions and achievements. And so he's the forerunner of some of the more current scholarship that began in the 1980s. So some of you might know about the Afrocentric movement or the African centered movement, that movement of black scholars and intellectuals, this developed around 1984. And you had scholars all across the country embracing African civilizations. Yes, I agree, the 60s had, a, had an impact, but if you look back, you can see Woodson was the forerunner of this. Woodson is the one that began to embrace African tradition, African culture. Um, and so what about this last section? So what about African Heritage Month or Black History Month? What was the focus of what's Woodson? What's the origin? Now, I've mentioned, as you saw, 1926 is when it actually officially was launched. But Woodson presented the idea back in 1920. And he told folks that they have to begin to do something practical. So he told his, his, um, his fraternity, the Omega Psi Phi, that you all need to do something. You're a fraternity. Go out and teach people. So they, his fraternity had a Negro uh, uh, History and Literature Week in, in 1924, but that wasn't good enough. So Woodson decided, you know what, I'm going to do it myself and do it through my organization. And so for Woodson, um, he decided to organize it himself. Now, what was the focus of Woodson? Because this is really the key. What did Woodson tireless, tirelessly focus on? Okay, I'm glad you asked that question. Let me answer it. Let me share with you what Woodson's vision and focus was through his organization year after year after year when he launched the focus on a week, but he constantly talked about expanding it to an entire year. So, um, so he was focused on black achievements. This is what the focus was of Woodson, nothing else, achievements and contributions, because Woodson was concerned that given the, the racial violence and lynching and the fact that black people were, were not citizens, uh, barely uh, were considered to be human, to, to lynch people with uh, a crowd of 10,000 folks and there's no justice, and then to write people out of history. He thought to write people out of history, black people, the next step was to simply eliminate them. So he focused on achievements and contributions, but in doing so, here's what I want you to know about Woodson so that he informs what we should be doing in 2021 and beyond. So this is what the celebration was not focused on. Here's what it did not include. So please make sure you get this because I'm expecting all of you to be leaders and take what I say and utilize it in the Woodson tradition. Because if anybody 
is going to include the things that I'm mentioning here that he never included, he railed against it, then uh, that person or that group would be operating against the direction of Woodson and what he consistently criticized. Number one, Woodson was absolutely against bringing in outside speakers to misinform the community. And he said this, he said that if, uh, if, if a organization or school is bringing in outside speakers or the community, they've learned nothing to use his words. In other words, you're bringing in outside speakers, why? Because you don't know anything yourself which defeats the purpose. When Woodson was talking about a black history year, the, the focus was to learn all year round. And then in February, you simply present what you've been learning. If that had been done for him, why would you bring in outside speakers? Let me quote what he said about outside speakers. This is Woodson in, in 1941. Woodson, he wrote, uh, and here's what the article was in the in the bulletin. He said, start now. This is uh, October of 1941. Notice the month. He said, start now Negro History Year in order to have a Negro History Week. In other words, you focus on learning all year in order to inform and teach during the time of February. He chose February because Black people were already celebrating at the time, and so he felt that he would use that momentum. Here's, here's what he said in that article, and he's talking to uh, school teachers. He says, do not call in some silver tongue orator to talk uh, to your school about the history of the Negro. The orator does not generally have much in his head. His chief qualifi uh, qualification is, is strong lungs. He knows very little about things in general and practically nothing about the Negro in particular, except how to exploit the race. And he went on, he said that these were mischievous orators and they should be boycotted. These were imposters and misinformants. So for him, these are pseudo historians that came around only to collect money at the expense of the community. He consistently condemned bringing in outside speakers and condemned the community for doing it. So the celebration was not focused on that. Number two, and this is no particular order, but number two is a big one. It was not about discussing problems faced by black people, which perpetuated the negative and racist stereotypes that black people only represent problems. So we need people to understand the reason why Woodson absolutely prevented his organization to focus on on problems, even though there was a lot of racial problems. He doesn't focus on lynching. He doesn't focus on uh, on um, on racial discrimination, segregation, who got beat up last week, who got into a fight. No, for Woodson, this has to be a focus on achievements and accomplishments, because what we have is this. There's no balance, folks. There's absolutely no balance. And so because there's no balance, almost everything is negative. When people bring up black people, what, what do they bring up? A problem. They got a problem with this issue or that issue, another race problem here or police issues here. Woodson never ran away from problems. I showed you his, his book, uh, The Miseducation. That's a, a thorough indictment. But this is a particular time to do what? To celebrate, to promote the culture. You saw our video, you saw uh, Kiazi Malonga, he started, he starts our, our celebrating success in our African Heritage Month events, and he, end, you know, he ends them too. It's about community, it's about culture, it's about celebration. It's about embracing that which is a part of us. So we don't just focus simply on the negative. So we need everybody to understand if we are following in the tradition of the founder, then we don't deal with problems. And you know, Professor Hodge is one of those gatekeepers that if a conversation goes astray, she would let people know, hey, folks, we're not here <laughs> for this. This is about a cell. So just remember, it's a celebration. So she's off doing her papers, doing something else. But whenever she hears something kind of going astray, she'll pop up. Hey, just remember, this is not a uh, <laughs> it's not one of those kind of sessions. So we stay away from the problems. Uh, black people cannot always be associated with a problem. This is the racist propaganda that takes place. And guess what? I know that this is not the intent of a lot of people, but I'm not talking intent, I'm talking about outcome. I'm dealing with outcomes. So you, we have to focus on the positive at some point and leave out the negative. 
And then tomorrow morning or the next or March 1st, whenever it is, then we, we go back to work. I'm not saying be naive, uh, but uh, let's not mix in all that other stuff. Uh, otherwise, we're against Woodson. He also was against worshiping individual heroes. So the reason why Woodson chose the second week in February back in 1926, because black people were they were in awe of Abraham Lincoln, who was born on uh, February 12th. And then Frederick Douglass born on February 14th. So the second week in February is why he chose that time. So please inform the people who say, hey, I I'm mad about this. You know, they gave us the shortest month of the year. Well, first of all, there's no they. Woodson took the celebration. Nobody uh, allowed Woodson to do anything. He did so in the midst of a vicious Jim Crow environment. And his whole focus was, well, why don't we have a celebration because people are already uh, celebrating, will use their celebration and shift from the focus to individuals to the accomplishments of a great race. And he made that very clear. It was about the collective, not the individual, because the group is always more important than the individual. And finally, Woodson did not focus only on African-American history. He went far beyond that. So if anybody's only focused on African-American history, which is valuable, which has to be embraced, there's no question. By the way, all of our themes, we've always had themes dealing with, with uh, Africa and the experience in the U.S. We've had themes like, like uh, from, from the Congo in Africa to Congo Square in New Orleans. We've always had themes like that. We have themes like from Africa to America, the California connection. So we've all, so we've never been naive, but we also have never been limited at the same time. Because if you hit your, start your history in slavery, the best you can be is a good slave, as Kwame Ture would always say. So we don't focus just on African-American history because Woodson did. So these are the things that really people need to know. Now let me end by just sharing you what, what he did. Now in terms of achievements, he took from his book, The Negro in Our History, and he uh, took some of that information he created, Negro Makers of History, a positive outcome, positive outlook. Oh, by the way, you should also know that Woodson, everything was self-published, associated publishers. They published everything. So for him, it was about independence of thought. Nobody can control what Woodson had to say because it was an independent writer and publisher. Now, here's some of the other books you need to know about Woodson. Here's why it cannot just be focused on the African-American experience. So this is what gets downplayed, unfortunately. These are the books he wrote about Africa. Now, the African myths and, and folk tales is one, but look at the other two books. These books here, the African background outline, in 1936, and then African Heroes and Heroines. Do you know that these were the last two books that the great scholar wrote? It shows that his focus is increasingly on African civilization, African heroes, African accomplishments, African achievements. So nobody can say that Woodson was focused on the black experience in the US only, that would be very narrow. His whole focus was to put back in the pages and chapters of both US history and world history. He made that very clear. He never separated black people from the global experience. People have done that because they don't know. You know, they have to learn more. They have to be more comfortable with embracing Africa. If so, they would be in the tradition of Woodson. But uh, these books are not usually mentioned because people are not too familiar. So uh, it's important to know about those last two books. So I wanna uh, end with a few more slides and then that'll be it because Woodson, his last series, now he died in 1950, he passed. Look at the last three articles that Carter G. Woodson wrote. These are the last three that he wrote in his life. It was a three-part series on Kemet, or you know, or he, he called it Egypt. This is the last three articles that he wrote in this series, in Negro History Bulletin. He's focused on Africa and African civilizations. So this is the Carter G. Woodson that embraced the black experience in the US, but he went beyond that to embrace the global experience beginning in Africa as well. So also, I, this is, I found this is pretty interesting. Th this article here, the Negro in art from Africa to America. And looking at this article, he, he, he mentions some of the monuments in classical Africa. So it's clear to me that Carter G. Woodson was beginning to learn more and more about not just the African background in general, as his book says, but specific contributions as he was becoming a more accomplished and more informed scholar. So this is why we can say that it's African Heritage Month because that's the direction he was moving in. So it was African Heritage Month. 
You can keep Black History Month, but if you leave off the Africa part, it's a distortion of Woodson's direction. So he began to focus more on the Nile Valley. I have a few more slides, and then we will open it up from there. For there, um, so the Nile Valley. He's focusing more and more on this area of the classical African civilizations. By the way, I, that's the course I teach dealing with Afram 210 to cover this in great detail. And so Woodson made these arguments about these African civilizations. This is his view. He said that Ethiopia or Kush and Nubia were the forerunners or the beginners, uh, the, for, the forerunners that came before the civilization in Egypt. So what he's saying is that there's an African foundation for these high level civilizations going or starting from the south. Kush is in the furthest part in the south and then Nubia. And as you go to the northern area, you have Egypt. He makes that argument. He also says that, that, um, that these civilizations they uh, influenced the entire Mediterranean world. Woodson went on. He also said that, that um, he said this, he's very clear, that the influence of the Nile Valley civilizations placed black people at the forefront of the world's original enlightenment. So this is what Woodson is beginning to argue and does argue in his writing and his scholarship. So he's clearly focused on African civilizations. There's no question whatsoever. So we can do nothing more if we're going to celebrate correctly and focus on achievements correctly than it is the African experience. And uh, now this doesn't mean that most people are doing this, but guess what? They are not following Woodson. I'm a scholar, so I'm giving you the insight about it. So Woodson being a writer, I mean, I, I can only imagine what Woodson would say about the African contributions in writing. You know, Woodson uh, being so keen to write and publish and, and recognizing that publishing is, is, is uh, the truth of self-defense. Because you know it is from this papyrus plant you hear you see here that we get the word paper, and Woodson is focusing you know learning more about this whole tradition. So I wonder what he would say today about Patahotep, who wrote the first book in the history of humanity. I didn't say one of he wrote the first book in the history of the world going back 2400 BCE. So in the tradition of Woodson, you have the first author Patahotep. Clearly, he's Africoid, comes from an African nation, and makes a contribution of writing 37 lessons of ethical and moral conduct. He's the world's first moral teacher in terms of a complete book form. And this is these are the instructions of Patah Hotel. And 37 lessons on ethical and moral conduct. And so this is a tribute to Woodson. Patah Hotel says, if you are a leader, See that the plans you carry, uh, uh, plans you make are carried out. Do great things which will be remembered long after you. And that's what's happening now. The leadership of Woodson, we respect his tireless work and contribution. He, in that article I mentioned about the uh, contributions in art, he talks about architecture specifically. He, he mentions architecture. He doesn't go into a lot of details. I don't think Woodson had the details. Very few people had the details, but he's pointing the way. And these are among the great monuments of the world. So the seven wonders of the world, so to speak, as they call it, these are the only wonders that still stand. How about this? Khufu, a 48-story skyscraper, equivalent, you know, it's 481 feet, could scribble it to a equivalent to a major skyscraper. And you got got thousands of stones held together without glue and without mortar. By the way, these boxes you see on the left, these are people to show you how insignificant they are in the grand scheme of things, they're building for eternity. Can you imagine the, the just think of the imagination involved, the, uh, the positive view, the self-concept involved to be able to, to even imagine on this scale. This confounds the world, even today. He mentions specifically Abu Simbel. Yes, he does. He, he mentions this great monument. This is one of the great monuments here. Look, how, look at these massive statues of Ramses the Great. You don't see anybody in the temple, but now you do. Take a look, take a look at how massive these really are. Woodson mentions these monuments, 65 foot high monument. What, what's important is not just the size, but the science of it as well. And if you're standing right underneath, it's a mighty, it's a mighty image. So, you know, Mr. Mills mentioned taking tours. Yes, I take the educational groups to Kemet. Anybody can go. We've had administrators, faculty, community, and uh, students classified as well. But if you go inside of this temple, 180 feet in the back of this temple the, is one of the great phenomena that twice a year, February 22nd, 
all the way in the back. And then October 22nd, the sun shines in and lights up these statues only twice a year. February 22nd and October 22nd. It's one of the great engineering feats. How did they do that? How did they get just those two years? What is those uh, those two dates? What do those two dates mean? We don't know. People have speculated it could have been his birthday and his coronation day in February and October. We don't know, but there's science involved. But the sun creeps in in the early morning. It shines to the back of the, the temple. And in the Holy of Holies, these statues are lit up twice a year only. This kind of science. And, and Woodson mentions it. He mentions these this, this mighty monument that is one of the great phenomena in the world where people go to Abu Simbel and see one of the great um, scientific uh, phenomena to have that sun go in. And, and how do they orient the temple in that manner? That's what people are not able to figure out, that level of knowledge. He also mentions the area of Luxor. This That's the grand area. And in Luxor, you have the Karnak Temple. You see an aerial view here. But when you take a close look at this, one of the things that, that's special about this temple, and there's many, is the sacred lake that you see here at the Karnak Temple. And if you gaze to the right, there's a couple special monuments. Do you see them? Here's one. It's called a Tekken. You might know it as an obelisk. It's a Tekken. This is, these are African monuments that were copied later. So Woodson mentions this area. He doesn't go into details, but it's interesting because you have some mighty monuments that were constructed that are made out of granite. You know, these are over three, this one on the right is over 320 tons made out of one single block of granite. And so if we look at this mighty monument, if I had time, I would give you the history of it, but just look at the shape of this Tekken, so-called obelisk. It is the model for the Washington Monument. You see the Washington Monument, you, you see the reflecting pool. Why would this be in DC? It had nothing to do with Europe or the tradition of Europe because George Washington was a Mason and they had the utmost respect for African culture, even though he himself was a slaveholder, but he had respect for the culture. And so the Washington Monument, not original at all. It was made thousands of years later, as you can see, 1884. So you have the real on the right and the replica on the left. Woodson mentions this. So Woodson is saying we need to embrace the African background. He also mentions in his article, the greatest statue on earth, Haru M. Akit, or you know it as the Great Sphinx. That's the Greek name. The original name is Haru M. Akit. It means the god Haru in the horizon. This is the greatest statue on earth, the most well-known and the most famous statue on earth, made out of one single block of limestone. Here is this mi is major monument. Here's a man here. Look how small and insignificant he is. It's a mighty monument, it really is. And so Woodson mentions this monument. And what most people see is the front view, but you got to look at the profile view. You got to look at the Africoid profile. Yes, I agree, the nose is gone, but the juicy African kissing lips are still there. And if you uh, not look, if you got your, uh, your screen kind of in, um, in small mode, you don't have it blown up, let me give you a close up of these African kissing lips that uh, I'm sure Woodson, uh, it was some reason why he mentioned this, <laughs> this great monument. So anyway, just a couple more slides. Uh, he's aware of Nefertari as well, always looking exactly the way you see it one of the most important queens, jet black. And um, he didn't mention King Tutankhamen, but guess what? His tomb was found in the 1920s. So uh, this was international news, he would have known. But anyway, take a look, he's Africoid. There's no question, there's no debate, there's no discussion. A ruler, t a teenage ruler who was as Africoid as they come. And he was uh, not even a, a the most powerful of the kings, but he was the king of bling bling, gold everywhere. Look at the golden mass, 26 pounds of, of gold. And um, so this is these are his parents. You know who these are? They're by name, anybody? Queen T and his father, who was Amenhotep III. I mean, what a family. And how come this is not promoted in National Geographic and Archaeology magazine? You got a, a royal family for the ages. And so this is what Woodson was concerned about, achievement, achievement motivation. What's gonna motivate people? Not slavery, not negative things, not problems, but achievement on a high level. And this is what he was concerned about and why he began to embrace Africa more. Woodson would not have known about Hesse Ray, but for good measure, 
I want to show them to you because eventually others would have learned about Hesse Ray if they had followed his direction to learn and study all year and then give their presentations in February. This is the first known dentist in the history of humanity. And one thing we can agree to is that Hesse Ray just came from the barber. This is a fresh cut, the helical structure of the hair. His afro is perfect. 4,800 years ago, 2,800 BCE, Amenemet the third. And um, so anyway, uh, you can look at combs and hair and you know that these are African people and Woodson would not have been uninformed about any of this because he's embracing Africa and more specifically Egypt for a reason. So that's a hundred years ago when he starts to work. So many of us doing the work today, we must give hom homage and respect to the man who was pointing us in the right direction all along. Even the dolls they played with, look at the, the fabric they used for the face and the hair, the Africoid. So this is what Woodson said finally, the aim of this generation should be to collect the records of the Negro and treat them scientifically in order that the race may not become a negligible factor in the thought of the world. What does he mean? All of the focus on black negativity. So just because there's a black event does not mean that it is relevant to the occasion. And this is what he's concerned about. Can't be a negligible factor, always being looked at negatively. The last thing is this his good friend, one of the great educators, Mary McLeod Bethune, who created Bethune Book uh, Cookman College in Florida, said this the month after he passed in 1950, I shall always believe in Carter Woodson. He helped me to maintain faith in myself. He gave me renewed confidence in the capacity of my race for development with the power of, a, of a cumulative fact. He moved back the barriers and broadened our vision of the world and the world's vision of us. True leadership, she says, is timeless, the month after the great Woodson passed. So uh, thank you very much, folks. And um, you all are now official experts on Carter G. Woodson. So appreciate it. Thank you very much.